Hello and welcome. Uh, today we uh, continue our devotional studies through the uh, book of James. And uh, we come in chapter three uh, to a new topic of his concern, and that is the topic of the tongue. Um, it's something that the Bible, in fact, talks a great deal about. In fact, as we view the book of James as kind of being the New Testament version of the book of Proverbs, we find that not only James focuses a lot upon the difficulty of controlling the tongue and, and, and really keeping it from doing disastrous things, but also we find that Solomon has the same concern. In fact, over a hundred times in the book of Proverbs do we find that Solomon talks about the tongue, the mouth, the lip, and the words, all different variants of the same issue of what we communicate when we open our mouths and begin to speak. Now, most of us understanding that communication is not limited to our words. Some people say only 80% of our words or our communication is actually verbal, and we communicate with our body language. And that's sort of implied in all of this because uh, a lot of times when we're angry or frustrated or unhappy, we tend to leak steam and we don't even have to say a word. It becomes evident what we're thinking. But it's when we blurt out those words um, that through an uncontrolled, unfiltered mind that we often find that we say things that we ultimately regret and wish we could take back. And sometimes uh, they're impossible to take back. In this age of uh, social media, many people are discovering that uh, they're having to live with the consequences of things that they wrote on the computer. They tweeted or sent out in social media. And uh, some of the judgment obviously is unfair as we live in this cancel culture, but a lot of it is things that really are ill-advised and people said in an impulsive moment, uh, basically a lack of passion control. So. Uh, it's not something that's a new problem, obviously, because we find in Proverbs, as I said, over a hundred times Solomon spoke about the same issue. I mean, think about this, when he talks about the kind of the, the duality, the dual nature of the tongue for good and for evil, he says the, the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. Well, that's a wonderful thing. Choice silver was basically something that was very pleasant and complimentary. But then he goes on, he says in, in chapter 12 of Proverbs, there's one who speaks rashly, like the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And we find that there are so many of these passages, like I say, six times in the book of Proverbs, he talks about this issue of the tongue, that the, a tongue can be a, like a soothing tree of life, but people who uh, pervert the tongue or use it in a perverse way actually crush the spirit. Because as he warns in chapter 18 and verse 21 of Proverbs, death and life are in our in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, the same way, as I said, he has many other ways or variants of talking about our words or our verbal communications. He talks about the mouth. Uh, for example, in Proverbs 10, 11, he says, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. And here again, some 33 times, he uses uh, a variant from the tongue by referring to what comes out of the mouth. He says, uh, through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. And so also he talks about our lips. Some 36 times he, in Proverbs, he talks about the lips. He says, I love this in Proverbs 24, 26. He says, an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. Uh, but he also warns, he says in chapter 26, like a coating of glaze over earthenware are fervent lips with an evil heart. In other words, when you look at a, a clay pot and they put a glaze over it and bake it, it looks beautiful on the outside and sometimes not really revealing the true uh, nature of the pot, that it's just really a pile of clay. But he said what happens is oftentimes people will put that kind of glaze over their words and they really have an evil heart with an evil intent to do harm. It's called simple deception. And then additionally, another 28 times, Solomon talks about words in particular when he says in, in chapter 7, my son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. So altogether, what we understand is that the ability to communicate, to be able to verbally communicate, is uh, one of the aspects that reveal that we are made in the image of God because God, first and foremost, is a communicator. I mean, the creation, in fact, begins when God says, let there be light. God speaks, 
and he says, let there be light. And that word that he speaks becomes creative. In fact, Psalm 33, 6 says the same thing. It says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, uh, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. So again, one of the, the very first things we discover about the nature of God is that he is a communicator. It's not surprising that we refer to his son, Jesus, as being the word of God, uh, God God's word that became incarnate or took on flesh. In other words, God was communicating his very heart and nature through the life of his son and the sacrifice of his son and the resurrection of his son. So again, this idea of communicating, and the fact that we are uh, we're serving a, a God who communicates. Uh, I love the, the uh, book that was written many years ago uh, by Francis Schaeffer that said, he is there and he is not silent. It's, it's a statement of great importance that God not only is there, but he's also not a silent God, he's a communicating God. But it's also, we find that the first evidence or the first reaction to the sin of Adam and Eve was that it says in Genesis 3.8, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day. Well, some 38, 383 times that word translated as sound is also translated as the voice of the Lord. In other words, it's not just God's footsteps that are echoing off the trees. It's the fact that God's very presence as he interacted with Adam and Eve in the garden was a communication. Uh, we would basically, some translations put it that it as, the, as God walked or talked in the garden. Uh, so that the very effect of that is that they begin to hide themselves from God's word. And so this is the effect that sin has. On one hand, we have the instruction of the Lord, which God has given us to guide and direct us. And yet on the other hand, sin causes us to ignore or to close our ears to what he has to say. And as a result, many Christians don't really spend a great deal of time reading the word partially because they don't think they need to, but also because they don't want to hear what it has to say. And as a result, they often begin to make decisions and choices that they greatly regret into the future. So anyway, what we find here in James, at least in this in this third chapter, is he begins to set this paradigm up where he says the tongue is one of the most wonderful organs of the body but it's also one of the most dangerous and difficult to control. And that's really going to be our mission as we go through this devotional studies this week is to really say, how do we uh, gain the level of mastery? At least I would say it's we begin the process of developing a degree of mastery over the tongue so that it does good and not harm. So we'll continue tomorrow. Blessings.